Okay. Um, yes, we, we are recording. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our um, panel discussion on PT uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. And um, I need to remember, in fact, I'm going to start with her. Um, our first panelist is Marianne Jaffe, who's joining us virtually. Um, and then we have Juliana, Dr. Juliana Letting from psychology. She is chair of the uh, University p and Committee. Dr. Karen Patterson, our provost and vice president. And Dr. David McKinnon, who is um, the, I want to make sure I get this right, the director of the writing center. Um, and so without further ado, I have some questions prepared for the panelists, but if you have any questions, um, by all means, please either add them to the chat or um, raise your hand and unmute um, yourself and ask them directly. Let me let in a few more folks who are joining us. And so I'm, I'm going to um, begin with a, a question for the provost. Um, I'm several years away from promotion and or tenure. What should I do to begin preparing? I say you begin immediately. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon. Uh, seriously, thank you for being here. Um, first, we are your team. We're part of, part of your team. Um, and we're really here to support you. And so if you're new or, or just in a tenure earning line, um, fairly new professor, uh, like the rest of us, you would have impressed a few people along the way in terms of, um, you know, when you interviewed for the job. And so um, generally speaking, we, we hire people that we want to keep. And so that's the first thing. Um, by that vote of confidence, your colleagues want you here. And so that's the first thing. Um, and, and so I want you to think seriously about that. Um, you're already into a team of folks who uh, felt like you had you were a good fit or, or the, the best fit. Um, and so if you're here uh, as you are um, and thinking through this process, you really wanna begin um, immediately uh, by being more purposeful. Um, figuring out ways to make sure that your research and perhaps teaching can blend together in, as in, in terms of, of working, I say, smarter, not necessarily harder, um, but making sure that some of the things that you know, we, we uh, want to emphasize are truly a priority. Now, I also want to say that this, this process is rather a selfish one. Um, and you know the, the the selfish perspective might sound bad, but you have to think of you and your goals, um, promotion and tenure on the way. What should you do? Um, and it can't be something that's an afterthought, or um, you know you prioritize everything else and then pull it together at the very end. And so um, just being meaningful purposeful as in, in the process, as you think of, for example, you're working with your students, the students uh, give you uh, good, good compliments, you want to turn that around and say, can you put this in a letter, um, you know, begin the process of developing that, that um, dossier that you'll need. Great. Um, I'm going to turn to something a little bit more um, mechanical about the PT process, and I'm going to throw this out to, to Marianne. Um, I hear that we now use an electronic promotion and tenure system um, to build our and submit our dossiers. How difficult is that system to use, and can I access it now? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, so there are there are two modules in what is known as Interfolio. That is our online um, promotion and tenure system. It's called Interfolio. And there's a component in there that is, um, and Gordon will correct me if I'm wrong, Faculty 180. And that is your, that's the dossier side. So as you move along in your tenure journey or your promotion journey, you would use that dossier side, the faculty 180, to go in and, and use it as your repository for all your materials. It's not a promotion tenure case. When you're ready to come up that year, I will build you or whoever's in my position will build you a 
promotion and or tenure case. Um, that's not something that you want to have created ahead of time. It doesn't benefit you to have it created ahead of time and put materials into that promotion case because all the timelines change. The collective bargaining agreement could change. So it would be putting materials into a, um, into a, um, a shell that isn't, you're, it's not going to be something you're going to use. Whereas if you start adding materials to faculty 180, um, then you can easily transfer any materials you upload there into what will eventually be your case. So yes, get started with the um, interfolio system now, um, but you will not be in a case. I will say though that um, while you start to upload all your materials, and I would say all of them, even if it's a materials or documents that in the end you might not use, just put them in there just as you would in a filing cabinet or in the cloud or on a, um, a thumb drive. Just save everything and then you can choose later on to use it or not use it. Um, but so, so start saving all your material there because it's very easy to transfer into your promotion case. Um, and let's see, I was going to say, so I was going to make up one other point, which I'll think about um, in a minute. Oh, I know. Um, but you will be interested in knowing now what will I need down the line? And this might be getting into what Gordon and others are going to be talking about. But I will say just quickly that you can um, send me an email at any time. Let's say you're an instructor in English and in whenever you're eligible to come up for promotion in four years, five years, um, you want to know what 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 is it I should be focusing on? What should I be um, uploading into my faculty 180 in order to prepare? And so there's two, we, two ways that you can um, inform yourself about that pretty quickly. One is to ask to have me share a, um, an already completed and supported promotion case. And we do have some faculty who have gone through the interfolio system successfully that are willing to share their cases with you. So you can get in and see a if you're in English, you could see a Mark Ari's case. You can see a, um, um, well, there's others. There's and, and same with tenure and promotion. There are faculty who have been gracious enough to allow us to share their successful cases with you. So you can look and see what they've uploaded in their promotion case. Um, a lot of it's going to be intuitive anyway. You're going to know that you're going to want to start uploading your, let's say, ISQs. You're going to want to start uploading your annual assignments. So the other, the other way to inform yourself of what you're going to need ultimately is the collective bargaining agreement. If you go to the collective bargaining agreement and you go to the relevant article for you, whether it's tenure, um, which I believe is article 20, or if it's promotion as an instructor, which I believe might be article 23, there's promotion for librarians, which I think is article 22. Um, Look at those articles that are um, appropriate for you, that, that would be your situation. And outlined in there is a lot of guidance as to the kinds of materials and documents and evidence you're going to need for your promotion case. Great. Thank you, Marianne. All right. Um, next question, and, and this could be for any of our panelists. What are some of the hurdles encountered or pitfalls that befall faculty in preparing for promotion and or promotion and tenure? I say when you put, put everything under the sun in your dossier. So that's not a good thing. Um, my, so ends my point earlier about um, being more purposeful, thinking about how you are um, teaching relates to your service if, uh, and or your research, um, having relevant documents, um, taking the time, uh, you know, like you're doing now to look at other uh, good samples and see what people do. You're going to have to write a narrative. So, um, you know, thinking through that process, perhaps looking at your work in, in, in terms of themes as opposed to sequential, um, there are just some strategies that I think you can think about to be able to utilize, but not seriously being haphazard 
or figuring out that, you know, if I put everything in it, somebody will make sense of it. Um, that's not going to work. Yes, and to build off of that, um, really thinking about not only what you put in, but how you put it in the interfolio system. So the interfolio system is wonderful um, as opposed to the binders that we used to have to mm -hmm. look through. Um, but it can be pretty confusing because you can't build like folders of mm -hmm. information. So each document gets put in in a list. So think about how you um, label those documents so that committee members and people who are reviewing your dossier can easily find what it is you're talking about. You're gonna describe information in your narrative and you wanna provide evidence for that in the um, supplementary materials. So make it very easy for us to find that information in the supplementary materials by clearly um, labeling what those documents are. And also another thing that we've encountered on the university committee several times is that there are members from all of the different colleges on that university committee, but there's not necessarily going to be somebody from your specific discipline. And so we need you to describe what is typical for your discipline. If you have guidelines for your department, that's wonderful. Um, we still need you to help explain what those guidelines are talking about. So in some disciplines, uh, for scholarship, you want uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, preferably with you as the only author. In other disciplines, multiple authors are regularly occurring. Um, some disciplines value books, so offering one book, um, and don't value journal articles as much. And so there are always conversations on the university committee. Um, for example, in a discipline, someone's coming up in a discipline that values books, and they have this amazing book, and they have described the book, and they've described that it's from a very um, world-class publisher, and someone will say, but they only have two journal articles, so they don't need to get tenure. Like, we need, I mean, hopefully there's somebody who can like help explain your discipline, but we need you to explain that for us and those narratives so we don't even have to have those conversations to remind, um, well, different di disciplines focus on different things. So if you can describe that, that would be very helpful. And building off of Juliana's point, um, knowing there's multiple audiences here who need to be able to write on your behalf. So in, in explicating what you've done and how you've done those things, what are significant, as Juliana's talking about, you've got a dean, a provost, a president who are looking for material to help make that case along the way. So anything you can do to make that discreet and obvious, I think just remembering there's multiple audiences. Great. Um, all right, David, here's a question for you um, as, as an instructor. Um, I'm an instructor or lecturer going up for promotion. Um, can I include my scholarship in my dossier? And if so, where and will it matter? Or do reviewers only look at the teaching materials for instructors and lecturers? So I'm a little torn on this, and I'd love some input um, from some probably management administration here, because um, I've always been told that we should only include in our annual evaluations our teaching and service, because whatever you include will be evaluated. And so I've never included anything in the scholarship vein there, but I know other colleagues do for their creative works and for their scholarship, and they get some sort of evaluation from our chair for that reason. When it comes to the actual uh, PNT materials, though, it's not clear to me whether you should include that or not if there is a risk attached to it. If there's a risk attached to it, I, I probably would um, not dial it in, or I would maybe mix it into my teaching or my service component and explain how it works to affect those things that I'm that are the majority of my FTE. But if somebody knows that answer concretely, I'd love to be able to share that out more widely with instructors as well. I say you want to be um, good at what you're um, asked to do to begin with, right? So you want to be well more than good, um, excellence in mm -hmm. teaching, right? But if you have scholarship, I think that adds to it. I don't know in terms of the interfolio, if there's a if there's a place you put it in, uh, Marianne, but um, certainly it, it, it speaks to um, you doing even above and beyond. And especially if, if uh, you, you find ways to blend your work, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to see one without the other. Right. And in your narrative, you're talking about it certainly you're providing examples. And the same thing, it's, if it's on your Vita, it's there, why not talk about it? But it, it shouldn't be at the expense of the good work mm. that you were already hired to do. That's, that's my personal feeling. If you look at, um, completely agree, um, if you look at the collective bargaining agreement under the instructor promotion, um, again, it, it pretty much details the innards of your promotion case. 
Um, so if you look down, there's there's a um, because um, the the drafters of this article knew that instructors were not required to do any research, but that we have a good many that do uh, do research. It's called it's under the optional component. So in a way, titling it as the optional component is a way that I might I don't know if you feel this way might reduce some of what you might feel as a risk because it's 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 not part of your assignment. You're going to be inputting your um, you're going to be uploading your assignment letters. So that will tell the story that you have 90 percent assignment in teaching or whatever that the mix is. Um, you're but but um, the provost. I, I believe that that makes so much sense because you're going to be referring to that in your CV. You might be referring to that in your, you know, how your teaching and scholarship, um, you know, um, interplay is, you know, the, the whole teaching scholar um, component. So, so anyway, but it is in there in Interfolio as an optional component. So it's not a required, they're not required documents. So um, but, I, but I do think that the interfolio system could be a little bit easier um, to navigate. Um, I, when I create, I created the templates. And so I update them every year, mainly just for the dates. But um, instructors in the past have had a little bit of difficulty trying to match the CBA with the template. And so that's something that I think could be clearer um, when I build the template um, for you next year. Great. Um, all right. So here's a here's a nice, easy question for you all. Um, what sort of evidence or supporting documents are most effective in demonstrating excellence in teaching research service? And, and, and I know, Julianne, you've seen a lot of dossiers. The provost has seen a lot of dossiers. Um, are there are there examples that you could describe that this was a really wonderful example of, of supporting documentation for one of those three aspects of our assignments? I would say whatever the evidence is, um, it needs to be explained. Again, I'm going to go back to that. Um, so, you know, if you're um, in the School of Music and your performances are part of your scholarship and creative activity, explain that and explain what performing at a certain place means. Um, if your uh, scholarship is about um, journal articles, explain the importance, the impact factors, um, how uh, likely you are to be accepted into that uh, journal give those kinds of explanations. So, I mean, provide the evidence as well, but also give us a context that explains why this is meaningful, because it doesn't matter if you do a lot of different scholarship or teaching activities, if they're not meaningful or they're not valued in your field. But since there are so many people who look at your dossier from different fields, we really, it's very beneficial if you can provide the context as why this is a very valuable, piece of scholarship or teaching or service um, in your field specifically. But it's also part of a story, mm -hmm. right? So if you think of um, the journey we're working with students, um, most of us uh, are hired to teach primarily, right? That's the big chore that we have if um, that's how we characterize it sometimes. But um, you spend a lot of time teaching your students. And so I think if you can tell the story with through the lens of students, that makes it really beneficial. Um, you might not necessarily be engaged in undergraduate research, but it's not too late. Um, <laughs> and so that's a way of helping to tell that story um, and provide good evidence because it's not just you talking. You can show how this work not, be, not only benefits you, but your students are talking about it. Um, and it's a great fit. It also um, dovetails into service. You know, if we hear forever and a day, service is not that important. It kind of is, because especially at your department level, um, where, you know, we want to work with our colleagues or, or, or collaborative. And the only way to do that is to pitch in and, and work. And so, but it's hard when we have to come, come up compartmentalize these things 
And then I tell you before, you know, you have to be selfish with your time and, and, and prioritize you. And so if however you can, if you can find ways to make sure that the story is being told in conjunction with your students, I think that's, that's, that would be amazing. It's been my experience that with the teaching, the ISQs leave a little bit to be desired. So getting feedback from um, students in some sort of end of semester qualitative uh, mm -hmm. device, gathering any feedback from them becomes really easy then to situate it in your annual evaluation and eventually that um, application for promotion down the road because you have the narrative. It's been threaded through those years and then you right. can draw on that and say you can see the threads here. And, and how valuable are peer observations of your teaching? Are, um, are those important artifacts in support of a case for teaching? Yes, they can definitely be very useful in trying to evaluate because, again, as David mentioned, the ISQs can leave something to be desired. So, um, but as part of the CBA, they have to be included, right? So you can't just say, well, everybody talks about problems with ISQs, so I'm going to do this other <laughs> stuff. You have to include them. But that doesn't mean you can't include other things that also provide evidence for your outstanding teaching. So additional qualitative or even quantitative uh, surveys from your students at the end of the semester, or a lot of people do at midpoint as well, um, doing peer observations of teaching. I would think about who you're asking to do that peer observation. Is it your best friend in your department, or is that somebody from the OFE office or somebody else? You know, think about who that is and their experience. Um, and there are a lot of ways to provide evidence for outstanding teaching in addition to the ISQs, which must also be included. But, <laughs> um, you know, and so this is just my own selfish, uh, but, well, th this to me feels personal because peer evaluations are great and I certainly would encourage everyone to um, get a glimpse of their teaching through the eyes of their peers, right? Um, and hopefully, like you ju you've just said, people can be um, genuinely honest with us, right? And tell us what we're doing, good, bad, or indifferent. But, and I excuse, they, you know, sometimes hurt our feelings and, um, and all of that, but we need to pay attention to what students say, whether we like it or not whether it's true or whether we feel, you know, because we get defensive, but take it for what it's worth. And then they, it's the what you do when you hear those things, I think is more, even more meaningful. And that, that's what you can articulate in your narrative because perfection is not what we're seeking. You know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't always know what to do, but when you get the feedback, don't just sit on it and like, okay, fine, the end. Um, and then wait to look to the very end to, to do something. It's it's continuous improvement. So so don't don't allow those ISQs to fester for years and then try and do something yes. about them the year before you go up. Yes. Because the students keep saying the same thing. Right. And if you if you if you're really honest with yourself, you know whether or not you're organized or you know the things they say about you. You already know whether it's true or not. <laughs> we just get our feelings hurt because they know this what we already know. Um, and then. <laughs> And then truly, when, when you find that they're really saying something that you don't agree with, then you wanna dig a little bit deeper. And that's where we can come in to help you, um, seriously. But anyway. And just real fast to build on the peer observations idea, um, you know, it's a great service to do to your colleagues, your yes. colleagues, but it's also useful to bring back to your own teaching and your own reflections on your teaching. Because oftentimes when we go give those peer um, classroom observations, we take back things with us. We see exciting mm -hmm. things that we then bring into our own teaching. So I think it's worth bringing to the, you know, blending that narrative idea here mm -hmm. that you're getting at. Right. And it's also very helpful when, when you receive those comments you don't like on the ISQs or the lower scores. Um, and the narrative reflecting on those and then talking about kind of the story, this journey, yes. what have you been doing to improve? So you might have some really bad ISQs with some honest, true feedback. Um, what did you do with that to improve upon and build for your, you know, the following years? And so, you know, talking about that in your narrative can also be very beneficial. I think um, I, so. I absolutely, and 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 the provost and I and others have had this conversation. 
a really um, sort of sim simple um, example, but one that really hits home is if um, with the students' comments, which are not insignificant, um, they, um, they will say semester after semester that um, my instructor did not give good feedback in a timely way where I knew how I was doing. If that's a, re if that's a repeating refrain um, semester after semester and you haven't addressed that. So that's a really kind of, like I said, a simple, but a, but a really good example of um, you reflecting on that and, and you know, taking note of that. And then you can sort of use that later on in your narrative, as you said, to say, you know, in, initially, because what you want to see is this trajectory, this change that, if, you know, you're evolving, right? So, you know, you're, so that, that's just, we've seen that happen. And it's like, well, this doesn't ever seem to have been addressed, but this seems to be a fairly simple thing that is holding students back from success because they're not getting feedback in a timely manner, communication, those kinds of things. I want to add one more comment to the, to the ice about the ice cubes. Um, because I think it's so it's so um, personal to so many people. Um, when students say that we are not doing well, it offends us sometimes. Um, and we don't want to use those eyes because it's like we don't want to put it in. They're being mean spirited. They're they're we hear and, and sometimes we know and we've seen research about the biases and so forth. But when they say we're doing an awesome job, we believe them. <laughs> So that's the balance, right? Um, seriously, just just take it for what it's worth. That's all. So so let me pause here and see if we have any questions from the audience. I guarantee the panelists would prefer your questions than my cheesy canned questions. None? I gotta imagine you came to this panel with questions in mind. Um, I'll just, I'll fill the air wave for, <laughs> for a second because as people who know me know I will do that. Um, so when you were talking about what kinds of evidence, um, this is what we say. First of all, um, we do run, Gordon and I run interfolio, um, Interfolio sessions, like how to work with interfolio as you approach your um, promotion or tenure. Um, sitting in on those is 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 important, not so much because you need to learn how to work with interfolio, which is pretty intuitive and straightforward. But the questions that come out during those sessions are really, really helpful because your colleagues who are also coming out, they're going to ask questions that you might not have thought of, but they're really helpful. So, so keep in mind, we do run these sessions throughout the year. Um, and also, um, like I said, take advantage of your, um, of a colleague's um, um, offering to share their dossier because you'll see evidence in there that you might not have thought of necessarily as being something you would have included, but it's like, or more importantly, it could be something that you then seek to do. Um, oh, this person did this, and this would be really this would be really interesting for me, and and I would you know that's something that I can do and start building on in my portfolio, and then lastly, um, always check in with your chair, um, and um, and and if you don't have a mentor, um, and I don't know if Gordon has mentioned this, you know I know that he's very um, involved in trying to create a mentorship program, so a mentor could be very helpful in this um, in this journey as well. I see a comment there from, from Stephanie. I was just going to mention too that we talk about resources and um, the library. And I know Stephanie Reyes has uh, presented on some of these, but thinking about journals, impact mm -hmm. of those things ahead of time and getting with, with her or her, her team would be helpful because those questions do come up. Yeah, and then that's just a sort of a shout out to um, to Stephanie and the li library. They're, they're wonderful resources. And Stephanie's been um, hosting a series on alternate metrics um, because in some disciplines, um, things like H indexes are and impact factors are very important. In other disciplines, not so much, or there may be 
databases you want to draw your impact factors from that may be more appropriate for social sciences or humanities. Um, so we really strongly recommend you go and see uh, Stephanie. She's amazing and, and very helpful. Um, Adam, your hand is raised, and, and then Chris and Isabel, I see your hands are raised too. Why don't we start with Adam, and, and then we'll go on. Hi, thanks for um, organizing the panel today. Um, I was just curious how the pandemic has affected PNT conversations and PNT decisions over the past, you know, eighteen months or so. How has how has the pandemic sort of factored into all of that? It, I think, um, from what I've seen, it really is about the story that uh, the candidates have been able to share. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't see what in terms of it being, certainly some people uh, haven't been able to maybe be in their labs as they could have uh, maybe um, meet some of the goals um, they set out to meet. Um, and hopefully they would have been having some of those conversations with their chairs and um, that's part of the evaluation process. And I know Marianne, we've had several MOUs uh, to with, with COVID and that with you know with that in mind and considerations that people need to have so you know we're looking uh again we are your team we're here to support you and do the best we can with what you provide but it's a story you have to tell and how you do that is is going to be very important chris do you want to go ahead and ask your question sure thank you um just a question about uh soliciting support letters from external uh, recommenders. Um, I'm just wondering about some of the strategies there or over there or maybe the do's and the don'ts. Uh, some of us are in uh, you know fields where some of the people we'd want to ask to write for us are you know maybe we we know them quite well from conferences and things like that. I've gotten mixed advice about you know who you can and can't ask to write those. That's question 12 on my list. <laughs> so it's a good one. That's that's a good question. And um, I'm sure my colleagues would jump in. Um, so I'm, I'm going back to my, my department chair uh, experience, having gotten the list from faculty and reaching out um, and then getting a response that says, I'll be happy to write for so-and-so and I'm um, using a pet name, you know, uh, <laughs> like it was so informal that we didn't even know her by that name. Um, and I just feel like that was a little too close. So that was one that that we didn't use, obviously. Um, but I share that to say in a smaller field, it's, it's challenging to, to get these letters from folks who don't know us. I mean, the idea is that you'd be kind of known. Um, uh, but seek your colleagues help maybe go through you know other people in your field who do they know that could um write for you or you know look at your work and be um objective right you want you want an honest you know you, clearly you want something positive but you also want someone who can be objective and and i would say you want to you want to find external reviewers to are as who are experts in your field who are top people in your field mm -hmm. They're going to resonate. Their their resumes or their CVs are going to resonate with reviewers um, more highly. And I think also um, thinking about how the different aspects of your scholarship, research, and, and creative activities, and the different external reviewers that could speak to those different facets of your your professional identity. So um, in my field, it's, it's getting people who work in my peer, uh, area of the world, and then people who maybe work in other different areas of the world, but work with similar materials or work in similar theoretical perspectives. Um, so you want to think broadly and then lay those out for your chair, right? Have your list of, of possible external reviewers and indicate any relationship or preferably no relationship. Um, and, and then what the rationale for why you're selecting them, um, why you think they would be good at commenting on your record. And that list, the earlier you, you figure that out, seriously, the better. I've seen many people submit names and the reviewers say no. 
not because they don't want to review for you, but they have other projects and they have had a similar request because if they're that good, other people are seeking them out too. And they will deny yours because they have other things lined up. So uh, um, I know we have deadlines and that timeline, but if you can think ahead, um, get those names to your chairs as, as fast as possible. Thank you. Isabella, do you want to ask your question? Hi, how are you guys? Thank you so much for organizing this. I am finding this extremely helpful so far. Um, actually, I have a few questions. <laughs> um, I've been working for UNF for a little bit over a year, but I am still not that overly familiar with uh, my wings. So can we go back, Marianne, to where I can find Interfolio? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so you should, when you get into my wings, there should be a tile dedicated um, to Interfolio. You should see okay. it on, um, you have a bunch of tiles, employee resources, okay. faculty yeah. resources. Do you see Interfolio on that? Um, actually, I'm not looking at it right now, but okay. if, it's that if it's that obvious, then I will find it. You let, you let me know um, when we're offline, let me know if you don't see it or you're having trouble. Um, Interfolio has been a little bit wonky lately where it's driving faculty right directly to faculty 180 who are, um, uh, so they're, get, they're getting lost because they wanna be in their promotion case and, and chairs are having trouble. So, so it's been a little wonky, but if you don't see it, let me know and we can, um, we can troubleshoot together to see what's wrong, um, okay? okay? Thank and you. I, I, Marianne, we did have that one case of a faculty member who didn't have the tile showing up because they're, they weren't quite coded right in banner. So it can happen. Um, so just, just let us know and we'll troubleshoot with Interfolio and with the IT folks. Wonderful. I actually had an issue with Interfolio. I have to contact them. Okay. And I also have two other questions, if I may. Please. Um, how many letters from colleagues are do you guys recommend for us to have if we're applying for tenure? What's that? What's that ideal number? Do you do you mean specifically from external reviewers or from your departmental? Colleagues? From your department department colleagues. That is um, is the way that it. I think it's supposed to work. Is that the chair? sends out an email to everyone and says you can write a letter if you would like so it's right. not that there needs to be a specific number um and my experience reviewing cases at the university level different departments have different kind of norms for how that works some departments don't seem to do it at all mm -hmm. and some departments it seems like every single person writes a letter and <laughs> um, so that's that's one of those areas where there's a lot of variation and i would um Check with the chair. Check with your chair. Make sure the chair sends to um, the solicitation out to everyone. But other than that, there's not really a whole lot that you could do at that point to get people to write letters and support. Um, and it doesn't mean when when we see departments that don't have or a candidate that doesn't have those departmental colleagues letters. Um, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say, oh, they don't have any letters. That must mean their department doesn't like them. Um, okay. So it's not usually, I've never had the experience where someone has interpreted in that way. There are, in the dossiers, there is a, there is a letter from the department committee and the chair's letter will indicate the vote of the department. Uh -huh. So those are, those are other indications of colleagues appraisal of the candidate. Okay. Okay. And also the CBA has recently changed. So everybody who is tenured in a department will serve on the tenure committee for the people who are going out for tenure. Mm -hmm. And it seems like since that has happened, because it used to be a small number of people would serve on the committee, since that has happened, it does seem like the number of letters that are being written from colleagues has gone down because they're serving on the committee. So they're having a hand in writing the letter anyway. Makes sense. Okay, and thank you so much for that answer. And my last question is, um, some of my students, obviously I encourage all of my students on a semester basis to uh, participate in the student evaluations, the course evaluations, but then oftentimes I get follow-up emails from individual stu students like with, you know, 
three paragraphs basically praising me for how well I did during that semester as an instructor. Are those emails valid student recommendations to put into your interfolio? I say those are excellent um, artifacts, but you want to, so when you get them, you respond, thank you very much. Can you give me a letter? Can you put this in a letter if they are willing to do that? Sometimes that's helpful. Mm -hmm. But keep it, I, I think, um, and then kind of weave it in your narrative as you talk about how good you are as a, as a teacher, okay. right? And you can provide examples. I would use them as quotes. Um, there are ways you can build it in. And I, I think it's important, but simply just to put the letters in by themselves. I don't know if there's a category yeah. for that. That might not be helpful. But, but you could have a, a section, you could bundle them all together yeah. in one document and have them in your dossier. And yes. particularly if there's a theme to them, if they're mm -hmm. all saying, she's so well organized and that really helped my learning. Right. If they're all saying that, then that's something you should probably be emphasizing in your narrative and then referencing those letters as evidence yes. in support of that. Thanks. Good sense. job, by the way. That's, that's awesome that they're doing that. Yeah, it definitely puts a smile on my face. <laughs> Thank you very much for those answers. Just to comment on this, to continue as a faculty, I'm in my fourth year uh, this year. Um, so I as well received uh, those letters, which is, that was great a question, because I don't know what to do about them. Uh, what happened in case those letters, they are slightly, uh, they are different from the ICQ uh, information, which one would be? the one that will be considered. Let's say I have three students who say I'm excellent, the other students I'm bad. So which one would be, how those would be? Well, so you want your eye skills, you want to use those and student feedback. Um, and then you can uh, use the, the letters to um, perhaps provide some counter to here they say them, um, this is not so good, however, here um, presenting this and perhaps why, but use it to your advantage. I mean, it is, um, you didn't solicit it. It's, it's information you get from your students. It's just as valuable, I think, but you don't want it, it to be in place of the ISQs because really that's that's the, the format that we want to use. And we can talk more if you want after this. About um, yeah. <laughs> um, Deirdre, I see your hand is raised. Do you want to ask a question? Good afternoon, everyone. I've got a couple. Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one question is, um, what if we had not been receiving uh, regularly the assignment letters that we were supposed to get. Do I need to say something about it? If you only see two, like, what do I, how do I address that? That's one question. Marianne, that was a question I was gonna to toss it your way. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so how Go for it. So what should, what should Deirdre do? Uh, all right, so um, this is not a rarity. Um, although an evaluation, uh, an assignment letter is required per the CBA um, with change of chairs or just, you know, sometimes um, it, it gets missed. And so what we say to candidates who don't have those annual assignment letters is to at least um, work with IR and get your um, FARS, your faculty activity report um documents and that will at least show the courses you taught and I think the percentage of your effort so that that sort of works um, in place of the assignment letter um, if you're not getting assignment letters and this is something that we're we're going through chair um, chair sessions now and this is a biggie and we've been really trying to um, emphasize the need for the assignment letter because really it is sort of the you know, the chair saying to the faculty member, here's gonna be your assignment. Um, it comes out, there's a draft, and then I think there's supposed to be a final. And I think that's something that gets a little bit um, lost in all the other things that chairs and faculty have to do. But, um, but that's your replacement um, for now until we can um, get this a little bit firm is your faculty activity report. 
Okay, and thank you. And, oh, go ahead. Can I follow up? Just one thing. Um, IR can be super helpful at pulling the far as they did it for me a couple of years ago because I had the same issue. And um, just everybody do make sure that you're not waiting until the last minute to ask <laughs> for that just because they do need mm -hmm. it some time. And if I think this is a common problem in a lot of departments, we don't want to be asking IR everybody who's going up in one year for them that last week. So just, you know, just maybe in July of the year you're going up for something, go ahead and send that email asking for those just so you have it and you're not um, rushed for it. And, and I would ask you when you when you contact IR to just CC either Marianne or myself on that, just so that we know, because as Marianne mentioned, we want to make sure that chairs are producing those letters on a regular basis. All right. And, and um, another question about that. And what if the ones you receive are kind of, um, I'll say generic, they continue to just have the same number in only two categories and it's they just how do i because i will it look bad then on the person going up if the assignment letter says this but you're really doing something so if if your assignment letter is incorrect that that's a problem and and for for a variety of reasons not just promotion and tenure purposes and so we would want to that would be something you want to to raise to marianne and myself um so that we can we can talk with you and, and see what can be done about that because it should be accurate and reflect your assignment um if it's generic i, I will say that my annual uh, assignment letters as i was coming up they were pretty boilerplate um, and that can be that can that can be very common. The the chairs are producing these sort of NMOS and then tweaking them per faculty member, and they're not. This is not high literature. It's uh, you know, Rikita, you're being assigned um, three courses each term. Um, these are the courses we expect, although that may change. Um, the rest of your assignment is such and such on scholarship and or service. Um, so they're not going to be um, they're not going to be scintillating reads. Um, but on the other hand, I, the, I, my my sense of when when I look at those in in cases that I've looked at in my department, it's often to confirm well, what is this faculty member's responsibilities in terms of teaching, research, and service, and so what sort of throughput should I see in terms of their evidence and their product? So if they're on a three three load with a regular tenure line research expectation, then I have some understanding of what I should expect in terms of their research productivity, their the number of classes they're teaching each term, and, and um, how much service they're doing. That might be different than an instructor who's on teaching four courses a term and has no scholarship requirements, right? Um, and so those assignment letters help me understand what is this faculty member's assignment. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and I think this is going to be another Marianne question, and, and it's not um, something you haven't heard. I, I don't know the final answer. You know, Marianne, how our CRNs in my department, I'm going to, you know, where I teach, right? <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, the seven number, the eight number. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, and the last time I asked this semester, um, I was told, oh, no, we fixed that. Everyone should get them. But I'm not so sure that it's still going to those that are less than eight. So how can I? Um, so what I was going to do, for instance, in my course was an anonymous Qualtrics survey that absolutely mimicked the UNF ISQ. Um, so that those 14 or 21 students who might not get the ISQ could still um, have an opportunity? Is that yes, no, shouldn't, should? What do you think about that? So, um, so yeah, what Deidre's talking about, so there are, in, in nursing and, um, and there are some other um, disciplines as well, where you get caught up in um, uh, the CBA, requirement of ISQs where you have to have eight or more enrolled. Um, also, um, the, you know, like if it's an internship and so 
the ISQ system has, you know, some markers like exempt, exempt, exempt. And so um, her discipline gets exempt all the time because of the nature of the way the courses are scheduled. And um, and so it's it's really just a result of the way they have to schedule and the number of students that are allowed in each sort of um, smaller um, course. So what we've done is we've tried to accommodate by I get um, I get a listing and I manually turn the ISQs on for those, let's say, six or seven students. Um, once I'm told um, from the chair or the director, um, I think that one thing I will say is that there are faculty, not necessarily in your school, but who come to me and say, my course is, is listed as this type which makes it exempt per the collective bargaining agreement. But really I run it this way. There's a lecture component and I want those students to have the opportunity. I can manually turn those on. So first, if a faculty member is concerned, um, they can work with me independently without the chair or the director being involved to say, I wanna make an argument for um, having my students, even though there's six of them, to, be, to have the ISQs made available to them. And so I usually work with faculty as long as the faculty are okay with it. What I can't do is have a chair come to me and say, I want this faculty member evaluated even though by the CBA they're exempt. I need the faculty member to say, that's okay. Um, and usually that's what happens. The faculty member is like, yes, I want the ISQ results. Um, um, I will say that we're still working on the, the old way to do it, Deidre, which is that I get a list from the director um, and, um, and I go in and I manually change the I, ISQs from no evaluation to yes evaluation. Um, I, I will say the promise is potentially coming and Gordon knows this. We've been working with a group, a large group of stakeholders to explore different evaluation opportunities where um, we can we can we can um, change the way the system is run so that you and your discipline, even though it's kind of unique, can have a unique a unique set of functions that will allow you to get what you need out of course evaluations. Um, so the day is kind of coming, but it might be a little off. So, so we can offline, we can talk about where we are with, with your discipline. Um, I haven't heard, um, this is nursing, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I haven't heard from Cindy yet, but um, ISQs are going to kick off, I think, um, the 27th, is that it? Yeah. So I'll be sending out an email soon um, to remind faculty. And that's when I usually get faculty saying, hey, you know, I, I want my course evaluated, but I'll work directly with Cindy to make sure that we can turn on those courses. And you can always check with me to see, you know, are my courses turned on? Does that, does that help? Yes, yes it does. Um, thank you very much. And then I probably need to talk to you offline about, because I know you've had this before, um, addressed from another faculty, like the mixed ISQs, like when we had um, the community course and rather than them having the students sign up for a particular faculty, they said, just sign up, we got a spot for you. But then when the ISQs come out, I'm getting <laughs> reading results that have a different faculty's name on it. So obviously some other faculty is reading mine that has my name on it. So that's probably an offer. Thing. Yeah, I let's need to talk about you. Okay, and then here's my last question. I promise. So I have a bunch of cards. Like my students will, they'll give cards, and the cards have comments. But now that we're electronic, how how can I? Do I need to scan like all these cards into a document? How can I? How many cards? Because they'll put because they'll put the comments there rather than fill out a, you know, some of them to fill out a. How do I manage that? How many cards are we talking about here? <laughs> no, I mean, I probably have like a good 30 cards I ever think... since I got on tenure track. That's not counting the ones before I got on tenure track. So de depending upon what kind of cards, I mean, if they're cards with those elaborate pop-ups, this may be difficult, but um, most of the departments, I think all of the departments have the standard RICO copier scanners. 
uh -huh. and they have sh the sheet feed um, option. And at the risk of potentially jamming your, your, <laughs> yeah. your department's copier, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you've got 30 cards, I think um, 10 minutes worth of scanning um, is, we'll get them all in one PDF. And um, it's probably, probably worth it to have them in, in a PDF. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Um, and, and in terms of getting mixed up ISQs, I would just pick the ones that are the highest and go with those, right? Um, whether they're yours or not. <laughs> Absolutely, right? <laughs> Thank you. So we have about three more minutes, which is uh, just enough time for like one short question from the audience. If there's someone with a short question. If not, then we can end on time. Um, and it gives me a little bit of time to thank um, our panelists, Marianne Jaffe from afar, and David and Karen and Juliana, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And those of you in the audience, please let your colleagues know that we've recorded this. And as soon as we can, we can post it, we will to the OFU website so they can come and, and view it. And, and we hope they will. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.